six on nine with quorum. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, so moving on, keep going. So um, in terms of agenda today, we'll cover a little bit about where we are with SIGs, um, have a couple presentations from the community, Nats and Open Telemetry, which is the merger, merger of Open Tracing and Open Census, and then the Cloud Events Annual Review, um, if we have time and a little bit of discussion around archiving projects and PBEs. So I'm happy to kick it over to you to Liz to steer, um, if you so wish, as chair. Okay, I can give that a go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alexis is at Walmart and has attended. Okay. Uh, well, I think everyone knows that about project presentations. Yep. Yeah, good. Uh, okay, so CNCF SIGs, I think one of the one of the goals that we would like to get done this year is get the SIGs um, kind of up and running and uh, you know, running like clockwork. Um, so we've got progress here with the security SIG and the storage SIG. So the security SIG, it says here that it's created and operational. Have we actually voted to approve its creation, Chris? Uh, outside of a, we have not done like a formal vote for the uh, charter of, of of the SIG. We've uh, voted at a meeting to actually have it created, but not we have not approved the formal charter. Okay, so we probably need to do. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the uh, process says, but we probably need to uh, have that step. Yep. But at least the SIG is kind of it's doing things. They are actually kind of assessing projects and, uh, and and doing things. So I think that's a, a very good kind of uh, bit of progress there. Um, yeah, so can we get a, a, a to-do item, Chris, or a, a, an issue yeah. about actually getting the, if there isn't one already, about getting the charter approved? No worries. So Liz and I synced a little bit offline um, and uh, it wasn't really clear what the process was from the document. Um, that is, you know, that it's very like, um, we had a charter in the repo and then there's a proposal, like it, is the charter supposed to be part of the CNCF repo? Is it part of the, you know, the, the project, the SIG repo, this like details, right? And so we have a charter doc that's part of our repo. We have some co-chairs that are willing to keep going. Should we just do an async? vote or comment, request for comment. We don't have that many meetings left before we so want yeah. to check in on logistics. Async makes sense, I think. I think so too. And I agree with Chris saying, I think the every SIG should own its own charter and it should be part of their own repo. Makes sense to me. Thank you. And the storage SIG, I uh, saw and made a couple of comments on, in fact, the PR for getting the storage SIG up and running, but that I think again that's a transition of a, an existing group of people who are doing things. So, uh, but I think we're in good shape to have these two SIGs. We're going to announce at KubeCon. Is that the plan, Chris? If they're both approved, yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Do you want to also say something about Amy? Uh, yeah, no, um, you know, we've had discussions in the past of, you know, having more uh, project and program help for CNCF and uh, we uh, hired Amy to help uh, with that and she'll be focused on uh, more importantly getting all the CNCF SIGs up and operational and, and helping uh, those work well along with supporting our projects on, on other initiatives. So she, she officially starts May 20th and we'll be at KubeCon, so uh, you could say hi. Awesome. All right, what's up next? Okay, archiving projects. Um, so there is a pull request. We've been talking about this for a while. I think we are pretty close to the point where we should just start doing it. Um, there is a pull request. Does anybody want to make any final comments about this before we call a vote? I think people are pretty supportive of the general idea that we should be able to archive projects. So yeah, let's, let's go ahead and call a vote on that. Cool. I'll do that. Yay. Yeah. 
Yeah, this was a last minute addition from Matt. So maybe Matt could speak to it. Sure. Um, hopefully a pretty quick one. So uh, we've had some requests uh, to expand the Envoy XDS data plane API beyond Envoy. So the first consumer will be gRPC. They are adopting the Envoy XDS APIs uh, for their look-aside load balancing. Uh, and as part of this process, we'd like to evolve the APIs, uh, you know, beyond just for uh, use in Envoy uh, to use in other load balancers and other control planes that are that are against those other uh, load balancers. Um, so we would like to form an official API working group. Uh, initially, this will uh, include folks from Google working on Envoy and gRPC, myself. Uh, we have commitments from uh, people in Azure, uh, as well as uh, Amazon AWS. And we'd also like to invite you know, folks working on other load balancers and other control planes around the industry. Uh, I think initially this will probably eventually live under the networking SIG once we get that started. Um, I, I think we view this as a pretty lightweight thing. Uh, we'll have some meetings, hopefully make sure that we're evolving the API in a direction that's not uh, just uh, useful for Envoy. And you know this might might in the far future lead to these APIs becoming standardized in, in some more official way. But I think right now we would just like this to be a lightweight process to evolve the APIs beyond Envoy. So I think what we're asking for here is uh, just general TOC approval to start this lightweight working group. Uh, and then I think once we get the networking SIG started, the working group would just roll up into that SIG. So I, I'm supportive. I think um, I think there is a larger question of like you know how much of a standards body is the CNCF because this is essentially patterns and documentation without code largely. Um, yep. That's not totally alien. I mean, Open Tracing and Spiffy are both sort of in a similar vein. Uh, but I think you know we, we've we've had this on again off again discussion around this over time. You know, cloud event. Well, cloud events is not a is not an official project also, which is a weird sort of like, is it or isn't it a, a, a thing, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit like we have working groups that do work and then we have projects and there's a question of like, well, should this be a project or a working group? And like, at what point does a working group turn into a project? And I think cloud events is a great example of that. Um, it's essentially a bunch of people getting together and saying, hey, this seems like a good idea, but it's not an official project. So yeah, I, I mean, I the, we have to like decide that now. I'm just like, we, we seem to be muddling our way through this. Well, I, I mean, Cloud Events is a project. Yeah, just oh, a, is it a project. Okay, my bad. I'm sorry. Yeah, it well, started and, as a working group and serverless yeah. and then evolved to a project. Okay, okay and, well, maybe that's a good pattern then. Well, well, yeah, and and this is, I mean, this is not just a working group. Like we're taking existing protos, so there, there, there isn't, there is an actual project. So, I mean, these protos live effectively in a repo called Data Plane API, and as part of this working group, we're going to be splitting them, you know, from the Envoy portions into the universal portions. So there is actual code here. Well, okay, so then I guess that begs the question: Why not just make this a sandbox project? I, I think we were just trying to start this as a lightweight thing yeah. and Chris and Chris suggested doing a working group. I, I don't think we really want to go through the entire project life cycle. So I, I think it sounds great to have this be a vendor neutral location where we can start having meetings and get a Zoom link and, and, and stuff like that. But I think we're not looking for uh, like a more heavyweight process right now. Yeah, in the future, yeah. it kind of looks similar to what happened with Prometheus and Open Metrics, in my opinion. But sorry, was that you, Alexis? I, I yeah, that. I was just going to say uh, that what you just said about Open Metrics, but also um, this is we're not a standards body. We're not ISO or IETF. We don't have a formal approval process for something, and then declaring something to be a standard. Someone could come up with other mesh library APIs if they wanted to and do projects there. That would be fine. I think it should be run as an open source project, even if the deliverables are documents as well as code. Sorry, so are you suggesting that we make a sandbox proposal? I think that'd be great, yeah, if, you, if you're going to do some code. Uh, 
Okay, um, let me let me take that back offline, and we can uh, think about how we would want to do that. Again, I think right now we're just looking for a for a vendor neutral home. I mean, you know, to be honest, we can we can start a Google Groups mailing list, and we can we can have meetings yeah. that way. Um, so so I think we're just trying to strike the balance between vendor neutral home and in not too much process. Yeah, I really don't want to throw a lot of bureaucracy at Matt here. So like, can we just let him do a working group and then we'll live all that it need be? Yeah. I, I'm not blocking on it. I just think that, you know, we're, we're, we're a little ad hoc on these things. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. But I, think well, I guess what I was going to say, if, if a TOC board member can't easily, you know, distinguish if it's a work group or a project, then there's probably a problem in the wider community also distinguishing that. So do we need to have you know, more prescriptive way of saying which is which and why. I don't know. If it's not clear to you, Matt, then it probably isn't clear to other people either. No, it's it's certainly not super, super clear to me. And I, I, I guess the reason that I'm hesitant to go straight to a sandbox project is that we would, it's not even clear right now what we would put in that sandbox project because a bunch of this code lives effectively within the Envoy repo today. And part of this working group is gonna to be to figure out how to actually split it out. So I, I, I wouldn't, like there's no code that we could put in a, in a repo currently. Like we have to start right. discussions. Well, and you don't have contributors contributing to that specific. I think of a project has a community associated with this and contributors and it's, it might support other projects um, but it doesn't even sound like it's to that level so um. yeah I, I, like again I think really what we're looking for is is just a, a place where we can host a mailing list and start having some meetings and I'm perfectly happy to organize that outside of the CNCF but I think Chris suggested that we do it within so I, I, I really don't have a strong opinion here I'm totally supportive of the idea of the CNCF being a good home for this kind of discussion. Um, I do kind of find myself questioning, wait a minute, did we just turn working groups into SIGs and, and how does this overlap? Um, but I'm inclined to agree with that there's been a few projects coming up just saying, yeah, make it a working group and keep it simple, which does make a lot of sense to me. But maybe we need to have a little bit of a think about what's a working group and what's a SIG? And, yeah, well, so I think I think my my thinking there, and there's an email from Lee in my inbox currently, which I haven't responded to, which is I, I think we we want to bootstrap the network SIG. That's definitely going to happen, and I, I think it would be a natural place where this working group would live under that SIG until we decide what to do with it. And, and I, I think there's probably a time box here of the next six or 12 months where we see how this goes. And then it evolves into a project with the repo, which has protos and documentation, um, or we disband. Yeah. yeah. Very analogous to the serverless working group in, in that regard, um, sort of defining uh, what we consider to be that term, a white paper, eventually landscape, go out into a sub-working group of open events, which then can turn into an actual project, a spec, and, yeah. and a sample implementation into a sandbox, cloud events. Um, that seems like a, a, that that's a, was a relatively natural progression. Um, and yeah, I, I, mean, I think, Matt, that, that's, you know, reflecting on it, that's probably my suggestion as well, that, um, that the traffic SIG or the networking SIG um, it, it end up is something of an umbrella for there are, I think, very near term in, in the coming weeks, probably around QCon, other related uh, projects to come forth. Uh, that, that will be, I could see other working group proposals under that same umbrella coming forth pretty quick. From, you know, from a process perspective, if no one's opposed on the TOC from this being created since we have quorum, um, we're happy to, to give Matt a mailing list and maybe a Zoom, uh, and whatever other resources he needs. Yeah, I, I, and again, I, I think that all we're looking for right now is an, is an email list and a Zoom link for meetings. Um, I'm happy to offline, we can discuss, I, I think there was a, suggestion on the chat about having a time boxing here, you know, so we're happy to report back once per quarter, or if we bootstrap the, the network traffic SIG, we can report back through, through that SIG. Um, but I think right now we just want to kick this off and get people talking because we don't, we don't even know what we want to do yet effectively.
So let's let's have that be the proposal that if the work will create the working group on and have it long term live under the networking traffic sig with a time box. If no one's opposed on the TOC, um, then let's just consider it approved and we'll we'll move on. I just want to add, um, can we also add an action item? And I'm happy to uh, review the docs and um, references around or definitions around working group in our repo mm -hmm. so that we're just clear on everything. So just as an action yep. item yep. on Aaron's point. I can help you work on that, Michelle. Okay, thanks. Okay, what's oh. up next? Nats. I think Derek, hey, Ellen. Hey, this is Derek. So hey, Derek. thank you guys for, for taking a listen for us. Um, NATS is a messaging system that uh, was designed to actually be the control plane for Cloud Foundry um, way back in the day. I still think it, it has um, pieces inside of Cloud Foundry and Bosch, uh, but it's a messaging system that's multi-pattern, meaning it can do request reply, it can do queue based, pub sub, and we also have streaming. It's been around for almost 10 years now. It's been in production for over eight and a half years in different companies. Um, it's built as a kind of cloud native um, microservices, very lightweight, very resilient type of a system. And at the beginning of 2018, uh, around March, we decided to um, ask for uh, inclusion inside of the CNCF. Next slide, please. Um, since the acceptance, there's lots of different metrics that we can look at. Um, we're, you know, most people have access to all of them as, as we do, but what we're looking at is uh, both the Docker pools and then the NAT streaming Docker pools um, have increased quite a bit since um, 2017. All right, we're about to pass 40 million for the NAT's core server. We have about 5,500 NAT's uh, GitHub stars. And what's interesting is, is we have a lot of production use cases that we are simply totally unaware of. Like we'll learn of them after a year and a half of they're doing their own work and getting it into production. And we might see questions on the Slack channel. Our Slack channel has about 1,200 or so um, active participants. Um, but for example, we just had a, a large dating company say, yeah, we just rewrote our whole back end using Nats and it's been in development for a year. We had no, no clue. So I think these at least for our project, we uh, have some of these statistics, but we also realize that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about because they don't really necessarily need anything from us. It just kind of uh, works, at least for what they're trying to do. Um, next, please. So uh, it's an ecosystem of servers and streaming servers. Think of a streaming server as being akin to Kafka. Um, and then of course, the various clients. The majority of our diversity, um, admittedly so, is in the client ecosystem. It's very straightforward and easy to write a client because it's a, uh, although a very high performance, it's a text-based protocol. So it's very approachable for lots of different um, developer types. But if you look at the maintained client, there's one in Rust, which is not a weekend project type of a, a client given the language and given the fact that um, things are happening asynchronously and there's definitely memory passing. Um, the core server and the streaming server, a majority of those contributions admittedly are from uh, the Nats team, both from VMware transitioning through a company called Upsera now to Synadia. However, we are starting to see um, people inside of the core server looking around, and we do have lots of contributions there. Uh, we do have a maintainer for the core server that is at Google, uh, who did work on some stuff inside of the core server, but we realize and, and are uh, being honest and transparent with the TOC that that's something that we are looking for and we are promoting. Again, we've actually went to certain large users and customers that we have. Um, and the ones either say, we're good for now, it does what we need it to do. Or the ones that say, oh, we'd love it if you just did this one thing, opt more towards NRE versus training up one of their own uh, engineers to date. Uh, again, that being said, there's probably a couple big companies that will all of a sudden show up in the core server and the streaming server. Uh, but that is a, a, a weakness in terms of strict graduation criteria. I don't think it's a bad reflection of the project or its ability to solve needs and run in production uh, environments for lots of uh, customers. We have a lot of community maintained clients. Um, 
where they you know, write, they write the code, they do everything about it. Um, and it's getting bigger. We're probably missing a couple there. Next slide. Uh, since we joined the CNCF, uh, Nats was kind of a standalone outside of integration with Engine X for um, rapid updates of its routing layer, which we used at AppSera, and I believe they used at uh, for Cloud Foundry as well for their layer seven. Um, we're now obviously looking at being a good CNCF citizen, and so we have been putting a lot of effort and are actually using ourselves the Kubernetes operator, which can control both Nats core server clusters and streaming clusters. Uh, NATS can grow to very, very large cluster sizes if, if need be. Um, also a Prometheus exporter with Grafana uh, integration. And we also have a Kafka bridge and MQ series bridge, which is the majority of the interest from the Fortune 500 user slash customers to date. They wanted explicit integration with those. So we negotiated even under NRE that those would both be Apache 2 and part of the larger NATS um, project inside the CNCF. So we feel good about that. And then we have a ton of community maintained connectors and utilities uh, from all different types of, of things, as you can see. Next slide. Um, the community is great. We, we feel that we do a great um, part in, in ourselves of being on the Slack channel and being responsive. Um, but they're always saying very nice things about us in terms of just works, you know, it's been in production. Um, you know, they, one guy said his t-shirt's going to wear out before he has to recycle the, the server. Um, so we really try to encourage that. And at the same time, if someone says it's not working for them, we're actually even more attentive and want more information from, from those as they pop up. But they're, they're very rare today. And Matt, um, and I had a really, I think good discussion on how does that in terms of the um, the way a project is is viewed from a user ecosystem, how does that affect how it fits inside of the CNCF and its criteria and things like that. Uh, next. So these are just certain partners. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of um, SIs come on board, um, specifically uh, they are being pushed towards us because of the license change in um, situation with Kafka and Confluent. So uh, we are not outbound marketing yet. We are about to go into outbound marketing mode, probably at the end of this month, beginning of June. Um, but we do have quite a bit of inbound interest and it's going up very quickly. And it, you know, fluctuates between control plane uh, or event streaming. But there's a lot of SIs um, coming in or people saying the license change on the Kafka side has to have them considering other options. Uh, I'm sure you guys are aware of that, but it's, it's interesting. It's a very specific pattern. So uh, next. Derek, before you move on, can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so you it talked about Nats partnering with companies. Um, is that kind of shorthand for the company Sanadia, right? Is, is it really Sanadia doing the partnering or how is that working? Um, most of these are actually just, they are partnering with us, but it's around that. So it's very clearly um, promoted and marked as Nats, not Sanadia. So you'll, you'll see almost no Sanadia stuff at all. But the legal agreement, if there does exist one, yes, is with Sanadia. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is just a, a small group of the end users. And again, I think for us, we, we very rarely see any of these companies come out until one of two things happen. They are really happy with the result and they want to share, which is a good thing, or they run into some issue, which for the most part, people get resolved on the support channel. Um, but we do have a, a pretty global um, representative community. And we also have, most of these are very strictly production. They're already in production. They run their production user facing systems using um, NATS as a control plane servicing addressing discovery type of a, a system. Next. And then here's the uh, I saw some comments this morning on the graduation PR obviously the website github um, Docker stacks slack again we have about 1200 members or so that's slowly been growing um, over the last year and a half. Um, we have a Google group that gets a little bit of traffic, but most of the traffic's on Slack, Twitter, or Reddit. Um, and so 
wanted to make it short and sweet, but happy to answer any and all questions that you have and appreciate the time. So one of the things that I'm always wondering is, especially with projects that are so closely associated with one company, um, what's, you know, the, and I, I want to see personally, I want to see some clear lines between sort of the company and the open source projects. I don't want these things to actually be conjoined. And so if you don't mind answering, and I don't want to, you know, uh, ask things that you're uncomfortable with, what is the sort of commercial offering that complements NATS that actually justifies your investment here? And, and is that being presented in a way that creates sort of clean separability between the company and the open source project? I think that's a great question, Joe. And it's very, uh, it's kind of like talking about religion, right? So we all have our opinions, but I'll, I'll definitely give you kind of where I- I won't pass judgment on like whether I think it's a good idea or not. <laughs> no, 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 that's totally fair. Um, you know, we've, uh, a lot of us, I think, have been uh, in this environment for quite a long time, uh, myself included, coming up on 30 some years. Um, my stake in the ground that I put to be frank is, is that I really felt that there were only three open source commercial models going forward, long term. Um, most people will disagree, but I'm trying to give justification for Joe's question. Bundle it with hardware, run it as a service, or augment it with a service. Run it with a service is not applicable for NAT because it's drop dead simple. GE Nuclear runs their servers for two years with no monitoring at all in their nuclear reactors, and they only shut it down when they're doing fuel rod stuff. All right, that's horrifying. Right, so, so running it as a, a single server in a silo technology, you know, that's not going to help. Now, augmenting with a service, people could say, oh, that's kind of a play on open core. Maybe it is, but it's a very clear delineation that we're never going to have a single code base that has certain parts that are Synadia and certain parts that are NATS and Apache 2. But what we've done is, is we've created technology inside of NATS that is open source that allows us to run a global secure multi-tenant digital dial tone, which does not appear as a silo, that we can inject value-added services and streams that don't have to be open source and we can charge for it. So for example, you can possibly see a case where we might have services which are you send a message and you get a response of some nature, let's say it's a secure store or a KB store or something like that, that we could actually offer for people who are running NATS clusters, large ones on premise and bridging to the cloud, they would pay us for that. They also pay us for training, education, consulting in our e-work but our long-term value prop is to be treated like a utility with that digital dial tone, which connects everyone securely. Okay, so then your, your goal then is with uh, uh, NATS, if you put in you know, capabilities into NATS that enables your services, then those capabilities are then available to anybody else to, to sort of compete on sort of an equal footing there. Exactly, okay. and I feel really strongly, again, in my opinion, so I know we all know Agree, but I, I really feel that the premium and a price model is usually understood as probably that's not where people want to be. But I think right now people are centered around open core. Um, I just qualify it as augment with a service, meaning there is a running thing and it's all open source, but it might be talking with a cloud service that augments it in some way, right? A machine learning, anomaly detection. Um, and again, for us, it's these probably storage services. So it makes a complete solution where you just need NATS, which has a very good security story with 2.0 that we spent about a year and a half on. Uh, if, and if everything is a message, not only to communicate, but also to do lightweight, but 80-20 type storage of KB stuff in a total secure multi-cloud way, that might be something that could help us commercially. And we could keep that closed source and not have to pollute or affect any of the NATS ecosystem. Hopefully that makes sense. Great. Yeah, so I mean, my, my concern here, which I talked to Derek about uh, last week is uh, like I, I feel that from a technology perspective Nets probably deserves to graduate it's it's widely used it's stable um, the part that I'm less clear on is this question that we're talking about now which is um, you know if the project is primarily driven by a single entity and that entity potentially can go out of business uh, what is the implication there for project stability? And I, I want to be clear here that I don't, I don't have the answer, but I think this is something that the TOC needs to discuss um, because I think the, the, the guidelines 
um, are not super clear in terms of uh, what are the requirements for either maintainers from different orgs or how much dependency can we have on a particular corporate entity. Um, so, and this is going to come up in the context of not just Nats, but other projects that I, I think also want to graduate. So um, I, I'd love to hear from other TOC folks in terms of what people are, are thinking on this topic currently. I share I share your concerns, but I also read the updated portion of um, uh, the proposal or the graduation proposal, and that made me feel better uh, a little bit. But I agree, we should have a longer conversation on that. What I would what I would be um, or what I what I'm also looking for or what I looked for in the um, repo was some outline of how security concerns are resolved. So. Matt, I'm not trying to veer off your uh, topic, but I do want to get some context around um, how do security concerns get raised and resolved, Derek? And are there any SLAs around that? Because I get the the part about you know there are only so many people who really understand the whole system and and that um, and that paragraph, uh, but I do want to make sure that there is some SLAs around um, the security process. So if you could go over that, that'd be great. Yeah, so that's a that's a really big deal to us because again, that's kind of a big push for us um, trying to innovate in that area. Um, we did with with uh, the CNCF's help and and Chris especially um, have Cure Fifty Three do an audit of us. Um, we also have a company out of New York that I'm looking at to do a um, kind of a black hat type of approach. You know, look at the two O release, which is coming at the end of this month. It's been in development for about a year and a half. It's been in production though, actually since last November, December. Um, we have had nobody raise any issues to us. Uh, Pure 53 had a couple very minor ones. So we immediately fixed them and then we posted the results with the, the, the fixes there. But we take it very seriously. We don't know if the CNCF has finalized a, a formal procedure where it's like, hey, reach out and quiet, you know, give them however long you know, to, to resolve type of thing. Um, but most people in our ecosystem seem really nice and friendly. So I imagine if they do, they would privately tell us, you know, hey, we, we might see something. Um, but we, we, at least for the system that Matt was talking about with a server that's been running now for years, uh, it just uses TLS as presented by Golang. Uh, the only thing that we had prior to the, the newest of uh, technology push on security was that uh, we decrypted passwords and you could change the the, the, the uh, computation factor, right, which was a, a trade-off. In the newer system that, uh, again, a lot of people are actually already running, um, we use ED25519 keys, so we never have private keys at all, and we do a challenge. So the two areas that we've been asking people to look at and provide comment for um, was on the ED25519 and various um, client implementations and such, and then generation of the knots, which is the biggest deal if you look at it from a security perspective. There could be compromises in how you generate the knots, which is what's signed by the, uh, the clients um, with their private key. Um, so far, we have not had anything radical come back to us, but we have had, you know, I, I've reached out to people I know and respect to look at it. So we're trying to be very proactive because it's, a big deal for us, especially with production. Um, but we don't necessarily have anything formal, and but we'd be happy to take um, part in, in something if we want to formalize. I, I, I would imagine we want to formalize it for all CNCF projects as a just general template of communication. Um, to Matt's point, Matt, after our talk, which I think was a great talk, and again, I, I, I hear you. Um, I went and I, I talked to some of our users and customers. And uh, I said, hey, you know, you, you, you wanted something done, but you opted for NRE instead of having one of your engineers spin up. And I said, why? And they said, oh, it's just easier. We trust you guys. It'll get done way, way faster. And I said, well, what happens if we all get hit by a bus? And they go, that's why we only use stuff as open source. Well, we'll you know, because I said, Are you, would you take it out of production? They go, no, no, we would then spin someone up. Again, that being said, we've drawn in the one a guy, uh, Oleg, who's now at Google. There's some interest at IBM. Um, and so I think we're going to try to pull some resources if they have that ability to get spun up on the core. Um, so it's definitely something that we're working towards. I don't feel that, I feel that it's, it's very nuanced when you're looking at the effect on users and customers of 
a single company kind of driving a lot of, at least the core server, maybe not the clients. That's fairly diverse. And the streaming server is a little bit more diverse. Um, but when asking them, it doesn't feel like there's any trepidation when I ask them about that. It's not like, yeah, we're really nervous about this. It's like, no, no, we'd rather pay you guys or ask you guys to do it. Um, and so I think that's at least a data point. Not that we would perturb the diversity efforts whatsoever, but it was interesting because I did go out and kind of pulse with people and said, you know, where's your comfort level with this? I mean, you're running it in production. It's a big deal. Um, and they consistently came back and said, yes. Yeah, you know, and, and it's and it's not just that though, right? I mean, and that that obviously does make me feel better. And again, to be clear, I I, I haven't personally decided. I, I think my own opinion on this, and I think it just needs needs more more discussion. But it's not just bus factor. It's you know, if a project is being driven primarily by one company, and for example, you know, not to get back into the into the business model discussion, which as you say can be very contentious. But if later you decide that you know you need to move to an open core model to, to make your business succeed, and then you know you start blocking features or changing the license or something like that, and you and you control that product, um, you know, is that what a graduated project should be, right? Like I I I just don't know. And and to me, um, you know, I, I I think I'm really on the fence here because it's clearly a very mature technology, but there there are definitely some risk factors from a from a project health perspective. I think those are fair. I think some of the offset is the fact that we're almost ten years old, though. So yeah, sure. Might, if they were going to happen, might have already happened. Yep. In the Perspective. I think I share some of these concerns, not um, necessarily in in the context of Nats, but more as a precedent around, you know, what if we relax or we decide that our criteria need relaxing, is that going to come back to bite us in the future? Um, you know, if we substitute um, instead of Senadia, if we substitute one of the giant sponsors does that cause a problem for for other projects or I, I have concerns i don't have answers around that yet yeah i think it's uh yeah it's it's hard to it's hard to to rationalize about and the way i've been trying to approach it is is what is the end effect on the community and i think the end effect on the community uh to matt's point if all of a sudden we decided hey or like you know Confluent just bought a company and immediately drop, drop dead stop their open source project, you know, and Apple's done it in the past. I think for the CNCF, that's possible with something like Nats, where it's a smaller company that's, you know, driving a lot of the innovation. For the bigger companies where I think there might be a comfort level, um, it could be a counter argument to say, but what happens if they lose interest? So what happens if Google loses interest in one of the big projects or whatever? Um, I think there are similar ramifications for the end user community. I don't have any answers either. I know that from our perspective, for the health of our you know, community and being part of the CNCF, we definitely hear what you guys are saying. We're pushing very hard. Um, but when we realize that all the users who are production users are saying, no, we're good. You know, even if you guys all get hit by a bus and go away or start going out, whatever, we're still very comfortable with where we are with using the product. Um, that, that's that's additional data points, right, that we can use in a discussion of, okay, you know, how does this make sense? And I, I agree, it's very nuanced. It's, there's, it's very difficult, in my opinion, to, to make it black and white. Um, so, I mean, generally in the past, how we've made this work is a TOC member pushes for a vote on graduation and we would call a formal vote. I don't know if there's anyone here that would like to do that or we could essentially hold. Um, it's, it's up to you. Yeah, I think maybe we need to have a little bit of a step back and think about the general principle before we vote on that specifically. Yeah, I, like I I'm a, that's in great shape, Derek. This isn't in any way supposed to be a reflection on your project. I think it's, it's more about making sure we're clear about the criteria. 
Right. And I, you know, I, I think NATS is a great technology. And again, like same, same, same statement. I, 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 in some sense, I feel bad that you're getting caught up in the, in the lack of clarity around this topic. But my preference is that I think we have a private TOC meeting in two weeks um, or whenever that is. My preference is that we discuss this privately among the TOC and then we decide on, on next steps. Yeah, I definitely um, look forward to that conversation. Um, and I think we're going to be looking at this across uh, a whole set of projects that folks want to bring into the TOC, either at the sandboxing or, or incubation level. And, um, and I think that, you know, as we look at sort of the, the set of projects coming in, there are a lot of questions around um, what does vendor neutral mean and, and what are the criteria around that? Any last questions for Derek before we move on? I have technical questions about the project since last I looked at it, but that's probably not appropriate here. <laughs> I guess my question is, is like, my assumption was that it was a goal for Nats to have committers who are from a range of companies, not just Google and um, your company. Is that true? We have lots of committers across lots of different companies. Uh, I think the specific issue that was being raised is uh, maintainers of the uh, server, core server. Okay, so I meant the core team, the people who are accepting pull requests and controlling the road now. Correct. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is just a matter of governance and governance structure that is, you know, brings in end users might be might be one of the one of the things to to look at here. But I think it's. Uh, it's worth for, for the TLC to get together and, and chat about this. Sounds good to me. All right, let's. Um, Thank you guys for your time. Yeah, thanks, Derek. We'll we'll work with you. I'll follow up. I think it's open tracing, open census time now, or open telemetry. Open telemetry. Yeah. All right, Morgan and Ben, you have about fifteen minutes, so I apologize, but hopefully. No problem. We can do that. No worries. So I'm Morgan McLean. I'm a product manager at Google. I've been on Open Census since the beginning. Ben, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Ben Sigelman. I've been working on Open Tracing since the beginning, and I'm at LightStep. Uh, take it away, Morgan. Perfect. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So there's a lot of different types of telemetry that developers expect to pull out of their applications. Tracing metrics and logs are probably the ones most talked about, though there are certainly others. Um, there are different layers to this. So for uh, tracing and metrics, you often need language-specific APIs, language-specific uh, implementations to pull them out. For logs and other types of telemetry, you can often get away with an agent. Um, and then there's other parts of your infrastructure, including uh, collectors, sidecars, interop formats, and so on. Um, there are obviously a number of projects within the CNCF that uh, involve these. Uh, however, when we look specifically at the combination of tracing and metrics, um, open Census and Open Tracing have been uh, sort of the most prominent ones uh, out in the community. And Open Tracing already being a CNCF project while Open Census uh, isn't one yet. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So when we look specifically at Open Tracing and Open Census, there's a lot of similarities. Um, they both offer APIs, uh, both have different implementations available. Uh, there are some differences as well. Uh, open tracing primarily focuses on the API while it left implementations mostly up to the community. So there can be multiple implementations per language, some vendors have their own. Open census offers a single implementation for each language. Uh, but beyond that, you know, both projects have broad adoption, both have pretty good language support, uh, and both offer a lot of the same functionality. Probably the biggest difference in terms of functionality is that open census also focuses on metrics. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, and there are, of course, um, some sort of issues that each project uh, has discovered. And I think as, as Ben has put it before, like, you know, after we've gone and, and built a thing for a few years, we look back and, and think of a few things we wish we could have done better. Uh, with open tracing, I think uh, Ben was saying uh, the, the one of the challenges that they interacted with, that they found was that they only deal with one vertical, and that's tracing. Uh, it turns out a lot of users want a single dependency for all of their different telemetry types. With open census, one of the challenges has been tighter, uh, in some sense, overly tight coupling. There's a great standard implementation, but there are vendors in the space for tracing and metrics who would like to use a standard API and include their own implementation. Historically, open census hasn't allowed that. Can we go to the next slide? 
So this is me. Uh, both projects are very well adopted. Um, you know, you can, I'm not going to read this slide, especially given the time crunch and everything, um, but uh, we can just go to the next slide, I guess, um, which seems great. So we have two really popular projects. And if you hit next slide again, it's sort of great. Uh, and that's the problem. So if we go to the next slide, um, the fact that there's a choice in open tracing open census is really problematic. Um, both projects, for better or worse, have escape velocity. I don't think that anyone on either project could really um, expect them to just die a heat death at this point if we left them to be, which is, you know, means that they were successful in a sense. But the fact that there are two of them is hugely problematic. Um, you can see this in the ecosystem all over the place. We talk, I mean, I talk with companies all the time as part of my job at Lightstep and this question of, you know, what's the difference, which one should we use? It's not just choice anxiety, but it actually creates um, it creates paralysis. This thread I linked to is just one of many, many examples of this, but it happens to be a very visible one with Hadoop, where they were initially going to adopt open tracing, and then someone said, and that, that seemed like a great choice, and then they said, oh, we should adopt open census, and they investigated that, and then they ultimately did neither. And so they just have, like, stopped. <laughs> and this kind of thing happens a lot. So uh, it's not helped by the fact that although the, the leadership of open census and open tracing I think are socially very friendly. There is a sense of a kind of holy war going on on Twitter, which I can't really fully explain, but, um, but that also didn't help. And I think about six months ago, we started talking about the fact that this is pretty bad for the ecosystem. Uh, both projects, the goal is really to ex expand um, the reach of telemetry projects into cloud native technology. And the fact that there are two of these things was a significant problem. So can you go to the next slide? Oh yeah, great. So one more. Um, yeah, so this is just from the CNCF proposal that we wrote. Uh, I'm not going to read this slide. Um, you all can look at it, you know, in your email or whatever. Um, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, I did want to address one important issue in the next slide, uh, which is sort of the elephant in the room here. Um, uh, if you advance again, there's the classic SKCD comic about standards, and that's sort of the obvious concern here. We have two, I know CNCF doesn't like the word standards, so we'll just call them two, um, you know, common APIs um, that are not the same. And we're saying we're going to create a third, uh, and that's going to solve the problem. So um, that's definitely the risk factor. Uh, if we advance to the next slide, we'll talk about our goals, long-term goals in a second. Um, the short-term goal is just all about uh, backwards compatibility. So we, I, I think uh, Morgan alluded to the fact that we have a bunch of technical regrets on both sides. And it was really tempting to take this uh, opportunity to just start with a clean slate. And we have resisted that holy temptation uh, and instead have basically decided that the initial scope for the project is 100% focused on being backward, backwards compatible with both open tracing and open census via bridges. Um, and this, because the leadership of both projects are completely on board for this new thing, we believe that that plus this relatively aggressive timeline that is described on the slide should allow us to um, successfully converge onto a single project. Uh, we wanted a separate brand as well, uh, just to make it very clear when people are kind of moving over to the new thing and it will make it easier to kind of wipe the old things off the map um, uh, and just move forward with this unified project. Um, we'll offer a two-year compatibility guarantee for those bridges, so people on open tracing and open census today will be well supported for a while. And in the meantime, between now and November, it should be safe to continue to develop the instrumentation and the, the you know, the, um, the translation process should be relatively easy. Uh, I think it's you, Morgan. Yep. So what we're actually doing is merging the two projects into one. Uh, you've probably surmised this. So we're taking open tracing and open census. Uh, as Ben mentioned, we're sunsetting those and open telemetry will, will replace them. Open telemetry will maintain a broad surface area. Obviously, we'll have tracing and metrics. That list of different types of telemetry may grow over time. Uh, but more importantly, it'll provide both APIs and a single set of reference implementations. So taking the sort of the best parts of open tracing and open census together. Uh, it also will um, include sidecars, data formats, and all the other specifications that customers need. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a loose coupling, so we'll have APIs that people can build integrations against, and the sort of primary set 
of implementations. We suspect that a lot of people will just go use the, or most people will just go and use the standard implementations. But if there are vendors in the space who want to provide their own implementations of those APIs, uh, that works great. Uh, and we have open governance. The governance model is already being defined. Uh, with with uh, we've got a seed committee, and and we've had a lot of uh, really great people help us. Go to the next and the next. Um, I'm not going to read this, but the, we believe that the product is a project is a natural fit for the CNCF. Next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, telemetry is obviously really important. The CNCF already has open tracing. Uh, there are other projects like uh, Prometheus uh, that are in the space. I think some other CNCF projects uh, to implement these part of the CNCF. Uh, so no surprise that a telemetry focused project uh, want to be homed there. Uh, CNCF is a great home for implementations, for APIs, and for uh, data formats. Uh, and so this project wraps all of those up together. So we have the, the whole sort of package that people can use. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, organizations that are already using uh, open census and open tracing in production. So we expect that to continue with open telemetry. All right. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess our actual ask here is we'd like to be made a sandbox project. There's probably some, if you squint, maybe you could make an argument possibly that this should be incubated. Um, we don't want to make that argument. Uh, we'd rather see the project, you know, proliferate, um, come back in whatever six months a year and make the argument with the evidence of that data. Given that the open trace and open census projects are both quite aligned about this, we feel like that should be straightforward, but uh, we don't want to get forward credit for things that haven't happened yet. So basically our ask is to be uh, admitted to CNCF as a sandbox project and kind of go from there. I think that's it. So then the idea is that open tracing would maintain being an incubating project while you slip the clutch on the new thing and something so like that i mean I, we're open to guidance in the cncf and tsc on how you want that to work um i think it was understood that we did not want to sort of do a rename on open tracing if that makes sense i don't think i don't think that does make sense um but i would suggest that we would keep open tracing in cncf um just because it seems easier and then once open telemetry well, basically, once open tracing becomes read only, which is the goal for the by the end of the year, um, that seems like a natural time to consider what its sort of ultimate fate is in CNCF. But but there, you know, open tracing supports a lot of languages, and will take us some time to get through all of them. So until we actually have a forward path for everyone, I don't think we can really just remove it. If that makes sense. No, I mean that makes a lot of sense, and it seems like you know, you know. Like, you know, the, the hopefully like, you know, folks and users won't reject this path and everything will be super smooth and you'll be able to to, to get everything moving forward and, and have a bigger community at the end. We, but, we've had know, a lot of conversations it. with customers and, and yeah. they've effectively all been, they were banging the drum on this before we even started. The yeah, th this was really, this, this happened because there was such tremendous user desire, end user desire for this to happen, um, which is great. So hopefully, you know, if we can execute, everyone will be very happy. Really excited to see this go forth. Um, and the only thing that'd be kind of tricky with making it a sandbox project, as I see it, is that um, CNCF's not supposed to like help with marketing of sand sandbox projects. But here we are. Uh, we like want this to to work. So I guess when you you get to the point where you want marketing help and effort, I think that's the point at which. Yeah, I mean, it's really an open tracing interest. I don't know if this is considered too much of a sleight of hand, but I, I mean, open tracing's marketing initiative would be to make sure that this is successful too. I mean, so you could think of it that way too. I don't know if that helps, but I mean, if you want to make it an incubated thing, that's fine, I guess. It, I, I'm, I just wanted to express that we're very comfortable not getting that, I guess, um, but I, I don't understand the CNCF bylaws very well, and it's really up to you all to decide what to do with it, I guess. I think moving forward as a sandbox is a good place to start and we can, you know, reevaluate sooner rather than later as, as this plan moves forward. I agree. I also agree. And just to point out, there's no time limit before you can move up to incubation. So right. um, we can look at that given our project processes, but uh, yeah, there's, there's no reason why we couldn't move you to incubation when you're ready. If we agree already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have three TSC sponsors already for the sandbox, so they're good to go. So we could formally get them uh, on, on board. Awesome.
Oh, with a minute left, I think that's pretty much all we have time um, for. So um, Cloud Events will move to next week for their annual review. And then uh, Doug, I, I saw your note about the, um, what is the end user thing? We'll, we'll, we'll address that in a, in a future call. Okay, cool. Thank you. And Doug, I'm sorry about getting the Cloud Events level wrong earlier. <laughs> I I, 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 it pained me, Joe. It really did. <laughs> <laughs> My heartfelt apologies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 30 plus projects, it's, it's, it's hard. So, all right. Take care, everyone. It's 10 o'clock. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See ya.